Mimi spoke of his life in this part of London. I moved six years ago to Hackney Wick, Felsted Street, one of the old warehouses. The landlords were a group of Orthodox Jews. They made a good deal because I was a photographer. They wanted artists to come. There was water everywhere, Mr. Sinclair. It flooded whenever it was raining. It was wild west. Every day the window was broken from kids throwing bottles, or Russians, drunk. Below my building was a Russian carry, carry oh, a Russian cash and carry. They threw Russian bottles of beer. I thought, that's interesting, multicultural. <laughs> Every week, at least once, a car exploding. Cars stolen for joyriding. Russians, gypsies, black kids, white kids. I called the police I don't know how many times. They never came. Always cars, explosions. It became famous. While I was having parties, dinner parties, the people eating, blam, blur, like Beirut. Good thing to talk about. Very exciting. 4.30 to 5.30 in the early morning, there was illegal rubbish dumping, vans. They were coming and dumping mountains of waste. Not one. Six. Eight. You know when a car has to slow down for a police check? This is Hackney Wick, exactly. A war zone. It was scary, but beautiful. I felt privileged to be on the front line. An island, Mr. Sinclair, like Sicily. Hackney Wick is the door to London. It is visible and invisible. There was a cafe just behind my building. A low cafe, sausage and egg, old working food, probably good. All the lorry drivers were stopping there. I thought that in ancient times there were coaches with horses stopping at a pub in Highgate. Here is exactly the same. Lorry drivers arrive from every part of Britain. Incredible. And then the market, the Hackney Stadium market, the idea of a Sunday fair. You had everyone selling everything. Desperate people selling to desperate people. The poor trying to make some money. It worked perfectly. Everyone needs something. It is sad to think that Hackney Wick will change without any grounds for change. There is no reason, Mr. Sinclair, so many social problems in Hackney. You can't tackle them by imposing new rich people, city people, new things from above. I've talked to people in Hackney Wick, very local people. They have an immediate response. Ah yes, it will change for the better. In a few years, the same person will tell me it's not better. Someone else will live where they are now in their houses. They will be gone, lost in Essex, and they will never come back. Mimi said, I did a project on the, no on the number 30 bus. I was taking pictures of the route five days after the bombing. I was away when it happened. My sisters, my friends, everyone was there. I was very upset. I decided to take pictures along the route of the 30, of people waiting for the bus. It was really moving because for the first time I had positive responses when I was taking pictures. Very unusual in London. I learned to look deeper and deeper into who was living in Hackney and who was taking the number 30 bus. I started in Hackney Wick and finished in Marble Arch. The bus. <clears throat> this was the talismanic photograph in colour in the newspapers. Not Mimi Malika before Mimi began his project of restitution and recovery. The crumpled wreckage of the bombed bus with its visible destination window, Hackney Wick, which stood just not for the des destruction of an everyday vessel for transporting preoccupied Londoners, but for the sentence of death passed on a redundant strip of land. Those two days in July 2005 connected the two events indissolubly, the hysterical celebrations of the great Olympic deal and the response of disenfranchised fundamentalism. Dancing in the studios, weeping in the streets, laurel wreaths for the victors, carpets of cellophane flowers, portraits of the missing painted to fences around building site stations. It was a time of fugues and forgetfulness.
post-traumatic wanderings from the epicenter of the blast. The driver of the bus, so it was rumoured, walked through the rest of the day out to the western suburbs before he recovered himself. In Hackney, a couple of years later, the skeleton of a woman called Shirley Slade was found in a ditch near the motorway, Temple Mills Lane. She had been with her husband going for breakfast to a cafe in Kingsland Road when she disappeared. He was a little ahead of her on the broad and busy pavement. He turned around and she was gone. The coroner's verdict was that she had succumbed to hypothermia, becoming more and more confused and disorientated as a result of the cold. Mrs. Slade grew up in Dalston. It was not clear how or why she had walked three or four miles across the borough to the Edgelands ditch where her remains were discovered, stripped of flesh, white bones in mud exposed by surveyors at the development site. A passenger known as M on the bus ahead of the fate of 30 said that he'd lost all sense of time and place and identity. He tramped in a daze to Shepherd's Bush. I think the 30 bus should have been renumbered, he said, without anybody knowing. Every time I notice one of those buses, it's a painful reminder. I wish I had been physically injured that day, because at least people would be able to see that something was wrong. But that is the wick. When you see it, it isn't there. And when it's gone, the ghosts of the buildings and the people and the animals begin to recite their stories.